everyone, and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Carol Nukamaludo, not Joe Engels, but she'll be with you in a little bit. I'm the chair of CMC's Board of Trustees, and it's very good to see all of you here today. Today's CMC Forum, Ethics, Cost, and the Comfort at the End of Life, is sponsored by Home Care Assistance, represented here today by many friends and associates. Won't you please help us thank them? This is an important topic and um, one that I think many of us are closer to than we would like to with either friend, families, or ourselves. We all want to ensure that we and our loved ones pass on in a dignified, humane, and comfortable circumstances. However, there are obstacles in place, legal, ethical, financial, religious, that make choices and the freedom to choose difficult at best. Death is a complicated and difficult topic. Please welcome our experts tonight. The director of OSU's Center for Bioethics and Hagop Machine, uh, Chair in Medical Ethics and Professionalism, Dr. Ryan Nash. <laughs> the general counsel of the Final Exit Network, Robert Rivas. And our host and journalist at Ohio Public Radio and TV State House News Bureau, Joe Engels. Joe? Thank you for having me today. Um, I appreciate being here, and this is an important topic. And I don't want to linger uh, with a lot of discussion ahead of time because I think maybe this will be something that our guests will have a lot of interesting things to say about it. So. Without further ado, let me start you folks off by talking about maybe a little brief history of, of you know, what you're working with and, and, and what the problems are associated right now with the way that we handle death. Um, go ahead and I'll start with you, Mr. Nash or Mr. Reeves. Oh, I can start. Whoever so wants the, to start. Um, the modern hospice, uh, modern dying in America, um, I, a gloss in two minutes, um, which is a very difficult thing for me to do. Um, and I have to start by saying, um, since my endowed chair is uh, 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 devoted to Dr. Mokshin, I had the, the, the Armenian name's hard to throw out for any introducer, but Hagat Mokshin, um, I'm thankful for him, so I'll just throw out that name for correction. But the, uh, the modern uh, phenomena of dying in America, um, prior to the 1960s, uh, most Americans got sick, uh, and if there wasn't a clear treatment with an antibiotic, they died at home. Um, uh, the community mourned the death and a uh, burial took place. With the rise of medical technology, um, increasingly death was institutionalized um, and medicinalized. Um, a realization of this, uh, the problems of uh, uh, institutionalized and medicinalized death um, were evident as early as the 1960s. And in the 1970s, there arose in largely England uh, the modern hospice movement. Um, people like Dame Cicely Saunders and others um, uh, launched this, realizing that indeed, despite great medical advance, people still do die and recognizing that the rise of medical, medical technology physicians and medicine writ large was ignoring the care of the dying. That they were focused on cure and recovery, but not care um, for those that they couldn't bring cure and recovery to. So a modern hospice movement was launched. When that movement came to the United States, it was largely home-based. Um, smaller hospices, now they're larger hospices. They were largely not-for-profit, now they're, they're are mix or for-profit, not-for-profit. Um, it was largely home-based, but then something odd happens in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, hospice and palliative medicine moves into the academy. Um, so the movement to demedicinalize and deinstitutionalize death um, in some ways is becoming a subspecialty of medicinalizing and institutionalizing death. Um, it's recapitulating, but in a different way. Hopefully in a kinder, compassionate, caring way. Hopefully a way that doesn't look for medical technology at all costs. Um, so now the way we die 
Um, we often don't have the proper expectations um, uh, laid before us as we're patients or loved ones of patients. Um, we often utilize too much medical technology and too much intervention um, in the last couple of weeks of life. I'll have more to say on that, I hope. I'll try to stick, say something more about cost in a, in a, in a moment. Um, and we, all that in the backdrop of culture wars where people want to argue for some strange reason um, and they want to see end of life care through the lens of the culture wars um, and the great divides in our country. Dr. Rivas, Mr. Rivas. Very good. Um, I'm the attorney for Final Exit Network and I guess since most of you have probably never heard of it, I'll fill you in on what it is. The uh, organization was started in 2004 by uh, people who felt that every individual's right to terminate their own suffering without medical intervention, without a right to die law, without a death with dignity law, just on their own in their homes was a right that, that everybody should have. And um, of course there's nothing in <coughs> illegal in this country about committing suicide, uh, but assisting in a suicide is a crime in um, 41 states by my calculation, and uh, Final Exit Network doesn't violate that law, um, but does go give people individual instruction and education and moral support when they've made that decision. More recently, we have expanded the program. Uh, that's, that's called the Exit Guide Program. The, we, we, we've uh, begun a new program in which we're going to start financing the legal representation of people uh, whose advanced directives are being ignored or refused and suing healthcare institutions that are failing to follow the law that prescribes that these patients are entitled for their, uh, their advanced directives to be followed. And um, in some cases, we may turn to bringing litigation seeking damages uh, against hospitals after a person has died, or healthcare institutions of any sort, after a person has died, if before their death they were subjected to the personal indignity of having their advanced directives and the instructions of their legal surrogates ignored, which happens too often. Our goal is to give people individual liberty in the dying process. So on that theme, um, you know, people are now kind of instructing their loved ones what they want to happen should they get very ill, very hurt. Um, do you see a trend uh, coming about now with the way that people are, are, are people really wanting something different than what they've had in the past? And, and what, are, what do people tend to embrace? Um, so I, I failed to say who am I, so I'm a physician. I, I run my mouth as a professor, I mean, so this is my main job, but I still take care of patients. I've, I've cared for about 5,000 dying patients. I've been at their dip bedside as they died, um, so this is not just theory. I've cared for a lot of patients in my career, uh, more than most physicians in the in the states. Um, I started my career in caring for terminally ill patients very early. Um, so. Um, Robert and I are going to agree on several things. One is the uh, importance of advanced directives and that they be followed. Um, I've been an expert witness now in uh, some high profile cases. One was uh, a Georgia case that went to the Georgia Supreme Court um, where a hospital failed to uh, follow, uh, willfully neglected to follow um, advanced directive um, and a DNR order and that was a million dollar open settlement. Um, I just came back from Montana where there, a trial went to trial, I mean a case went to trial and uh, the hospital willfully neglected to follow a DNR order. Um, and this was uh, a large judgment as well, um, around half million dollar judgment. Um, so I do think one of the things that's changing, this is newsworthy. I mean, that the, the case in Georgia made the New York Times twice. The, uh, um, a lot of legal magazines and others are saying, wow, watch out. We actually have to pay attention to these. The Good Samaritan, mind you, the Good Samaritan never jumped on someone and started doing resuscitation. The Good Samaritan provided food and clothing, I mean, uh, yeah, food and shelter. Um, 
And the Good Samaritan laws don't cover this. So one the movement is I think hospitals are about to get the wake up call that you have to actually abide by these orders. The law is already there. The law says you have to abide by them. And the poli hospital policies all say you have to abide by them. But I think increasingly physicians, I do think it's an unusual step, these cases that they're, they're not abided by. In the 1980s, if you talked about a do not resuscitate order, it was controversial. A lot of physicians would say, no, we must, if, we must heal. And if we don't heal, I'm not going to sit by and watch my patient die. Now, if I polled physicians at, um, at uh, Ohio State or any other major hospital, they would say, of course I'm going to honor my patient's wish not to have resuscitation. And they'd probably say, and we ought not use resuscitation if it's not going to be helpful. Um, so I think that's one uh, change from the uh, physician and practitioner side. On the patient side, I see a real willingness of patients to, tr to try to say, I, I value life, I want to live, but I also don't want all burdens, all burdens aren't acceptable. Um, and I think the biggest shift, we've, we've painted the hospice and palliative movement versus traditional medicine, I think in a wrong light. Instead of it being an alternative pathway, alternative medicine, like I choose hospice. I can't remember the last patient I had that chose hospice. You know, um, like, oh, here's your options. Oh, I'll choose the hospice one. That's not very common. Um, our most common patient is someone who's had chemo and surgery and radiation, and they'd have more if it was helpful, but they're dying anyway. And hospice is the best medicine for them. That's the vast majority. So that makes um, hospice and palliative movement part of the overall arching movement or, or of quality medicine. Um, now, someone like my grandfather, um, who had CML, he had cancer, was incurable. Um, he, had, um, he got sick with pneumonia, went in the hospital, had kidney failure, and he just said, I don't want dialysis. I'll choose that hospice route. There's still a choice somewhat, but the vast majority of my patients didn't choose a hospice or choose hospice. They chose uh, reluctantly acquiesce to hospice. Um, so I think those are some of the changes. Mr. Rivas? Dr. Nash, can I hire you for some of my up <laughs> upcoming <laughs> cases? I, I need an expert witness in your field. Oh, so it'd be, it'd be ironic because I'm, I'm opposed to physician-assisted suicide, physician aid in dying and uh, suicide. Um, so it'd be ironic, but uh, on that topic, yes. <laughs> <clears throat> we would solely be suing to vindicate the law that gives pe legal cir circumstances where people I'm have a right, and the and the uh, and the healthcare institution denies them their their legal rights, and that's the only cases where we'd be involved. We want to be like the 911 for people with that problem, and the number of people with that problem is really quite astounding, uh, as we hear them all over the country. Um, when it comes to advanced directives, if there's anything in the world that was good about the incredible circus that was the death of Terry Schiavo, which took 14 years, it was that the whole country learned a, an important lesson, saw firsthand what can happen if you don't have an advanced directive. And those advanced directives are essential to giving the, the, the healthcare institutions the, the instructions that they need to uh, uh, be able to carry out your wishes. One of the things that's happening that's causing all of this, the problem that we're here to talk about today, is not just the medicalization of the uh, health care of the person at the end, it's also the fact that so many people live so much longer than they ever did in history. They survive the heart attacks, the pneumonia, and then they, as they age, they experience more and more real bad illnesses that make them feel bad, make them disabled. And at some point, people who are competent adults ought to not have, and this is the one we agree on, ought to not have anybody interfere with it if they decide that their, that their time has come. And, um, and here's the part we disagree on. The physician aid and dying laws across the country, uh, you, you probably all, most of you know that there are seven states that have, that have legalized physician aid and dying which uh, is sometimes called assisted suicide. That term was made up by the opponents of it to make it sound ridiculous. But um, <laughs> the, the, these physician-assisted suicide laws uh, exclude anybody unless they're within six months. The doctor can 
say within a reasonable degree of medical probability that they're going to die within six months, I think most doctors will tell you that that's not a realistic assessment that they can make at that stage of the process because people can just happen to live a year, you know. But there are many people who are excluded from physician aid and dying laws because they have long, slow illnesses and they have to be able to take the medication and people with, for instance, ALS will cross over a threshold where they're no longer capable of taking the medication long before a doctor could certify that they're going to die within six months. There's no rational justification to deny a physician aid and dying to those people, but they're, they're among the people that Final Exit Network exists to, uh, 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 to give an alternative to. One of the problems with living a long time and dealing with an illness that is terminal is that you can spend a small fortune keeping yourself alive to have a minimum quality of life, yet there's an issue, um, there's a conflict there. You don't want to give up. You don't want to, you want the miracle to happen. You don't want to give up on life. Do you find that a lot of people have that internal conflict and and I suspect that it probably trends down to you know to their families and friends that um, exacerbate it well fam families clearly have the conflict so if they're if, uh, if someone's caring for a loved one or deciding for a loved one in the ICU uh, they have this conflict between I love them I want to make them whole I want them recovered and well, they wouldn't want to die like this. This is not bringing healing. I know medicine's not the source of eternal life. They're dying and I'm going to accept that. And that conflict between these two things um, puts them on kind of an emotional roller coaster, right? Um, and then if they decide we'll stop, um, we'll remove um, some of the technologies, and the patient, their loved one doesn't die quickly, um, they, have a, they experience a phenomena that I've, I call the failure to die syndrome. Um, and that is they start thinking, um, one, some people may be thinking, well, I have a plane out of town on Tuesday. You know, um, I was planning to stay for the funeral. But others may really start thinking, well, did I make the wrong decision? They're still living. Uh, and they do go back and forth on this emotional roller coaster. Patients that are aware and have life-limiting illness or terminal illness diagnosis have some of the same emotional roller coaster. Uh, if, um, if you ask Christopher Reeve when he was 33 in Superman if he would want to live as a high cervical quad, how many of you would say, yes, I want to live as a high cervical quad on a ventilator? He'd say, no way. You ask him five minutes or five days after he had his horse riding accident, and would you want to live on, with on a ventilator and fight for this? He says, I'll fight for a time. And then he gets so sick that he says, I acquiesce. I, I broke my neck in May um, of this last year in a horse riding accident. Um, I've recovered far, more, far better than I ever expected. Um, for a day or so, I thought those same thoughts. I didn't know if I was going to be a high cervical quad or not. Um, and th there's some relation here as well. Uh, when we think about cost, I'll go ahead and throw in my cost line. Um, there's data set that says that we spend most of our, you know, one, we always hear that health, we spend, um, what, 17.5% of our GDP on healthcare, and that's non-sustainable. Now, we've heard that for 30 years, 40 years maybe. It keeps on sustaining as it creates a microeconomy, but that's a long lecture. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, most, a, a, a large proportion of that cost is in the final two weeks of life. Now, in some cases, that seems problematic, and most people will say, we are spending too much at the end of life. Well, maybe. When I fell off my horse, well, actually, I was thrown off my horse. I'm a Texan. I don't fall off horses. <laughs> I, was, I was thrown off my horse. Um, and uh, when I broke my neck, it wasn't clear that I'd survive. Um, if, after, you know, I, I exhausted my deductible in about two and a half hours. You know, um, I met it. And then I had multiple surgeries very quickly and had pretty uh, um, uh, elaborate care. If I would have died at the end of two weeks um, after multiple surgeries after a traumatic, a traumatic illness, I don't think anyone would say that was inappropriate use of trying to save my life. Um, however, if I have a patient with metastatic cancer that we know we can't cure, um, who's dying from that cancer, and we know none of the medical technologies we have are going to re reverse that dying process. It sees inappropriate, not just um, 
uh, for cost reason, but it, it, it's, a, it's the wrong utilization of medicine um, to utilize medical technologies and medicines and physician care um, to try to forestall death in such a circumstance. Mr. Ravis, do you have anything to add to that? Or? On the conflict, on the subject of the conflict, it, it, uh, it, it makes a big difference the age of the person. You know, a person who's 33 who's uh, had a spinal injury and is going to be subjected to being on a ventilator is, is still a, a young person's mind and his mentality is to do everything. Death is a horrible thought, but a lot of people, when they get older, begin to recognize that uh, uh, they're, they're going to die, and they don't want their death to be a horrible experience. I mean, other than the fact that you get dead at the end. <laughs> they, they don't want their death to be a drawn-out, horrible experience, and for that reason, they want to discontinue, discontinue or not accept uh, treatment. And if it's a rational, a rational choice, um, we uh, think that they ought to be able to make the choice, whether it's because of discontinuing or not accepting medical treatment, or if it's because they make the choice to actively do it themselves. Um, we found over the years at Final Exit Network that it, it's a big problem to deal with that conflict that you're talking about for, for us because we, uh, we feel that a, if a person wants to choose to die, uh, to terminate their suffering, Premature, prematurely, uh, of their, you know, in, in their own manner and time, um, and their young, their sons, their kids don't want them to do that. That creates a, a, a big conflict, and we have made it a practice to, you know, in all cases, to try as hard as we can to go to the loved ones of a person who's dying and help them understand that they shouldn't oppose it because the opposition of the of the the loved ones in the family is is a uh, a big problem that we we routinely try to help solve. We've had some reconciliations of, in one case I can think of, a father and a son who hadn't spoken in 30 years because they thought they hated each other until the son learned that the dad had chosen to die. Um, but those are my thoughts about it. Just a couple of follow-up. Um, I, I, I do think one of the challenges is that people change their mind. Um, humans are fickle. Um, so when you, one of the points of Christopher Reeve is that as he got sick, he changed his mind. And a lot of patients, I work, my clinic is at the James Cancer Center. If I have someone with terminal cancer who I'm doing advanced care planning with, I go through what may be ex expected in their course, they may say, well, I'm, I don't want to be a burden to my family. I don't want to accept these burdens. These are unacceptable. But as they get sicker, and the data shows this, and my experience um, shows this, many of them, not all, but many of them are willing to accept greater burden. They're willing to accept greater symptoms. They're willing to accept the care of their loved one. Um, and they change their mind as they go. Um, to a point, there comes a point where they're not willing to accept greater burden. They're not willing to uh, uh, be more of a burden. But one of the challenges of doing advanced directives, especially things like living wills that say, if I am deemed by two physicians to have a terminal irreversible condition, um, I don't want heroic measures. I don't know what that means. I mean, it's basically a value judgment um, that's important to make the value judgment. But once you have a life-limiting illness, once you have a terminal illness, we need to get far more specific. I like things like pulsed forms, um, the uh, for, uh, physician orders for life-sustaining treatment. I think, I, and I've on a, I'm on a legislative working group in Ohio to try to bring pulsed here, which keeps getting blocked for some reason. Um, they've been trying for a decade. But uh, I think those are important. Now, when it comes to um, final exit, I think final exit's a really unique uh, group. I mean, I, I, we disagree on whether suicide is um, good or ought to be done. But I think final exit actually takes away one of the arguments for physician aid in dying or physician assisted suicide. Um, this was the argument of safety, that you can have a efficient, it's funny to call it safety, right? Because the patient's dead at the end. <laughs> uh, um, so, th th but the, the argument of safety for, is that a physician need be involved so there'd be efficient and um, painless, no, no needless suffering, kind of like the way we think of executions, no needless suffering. Um, but final exit's created a way you don't need physicians. 
Now, you could have spouse-assisted suicide or lawyer-assisted suicide or a thanatologist-assisted suicide, and Final Exit shown that. So I think that in the argument, Final Exit has thrown kind of a, a, a unique uh, uh, wrench into the argument for a PAD, for a physician aid in dying, which I think is a silly term, although I would mark who coined that silly term to be the other side because um, I, I think it's more accurate to say assisted suicide. Is there something in the dying process um, that specifically you see right now that needs to be changed? Something that, that is happening that maybe people aren't in the right, right mindset or maybe medical, the medical community is not in the right, right mindset or something like that? I can think of two. Okay. What do you think? One is I think laws and policies need to be updated. Um, this term, uh, Robert's exactly right, the term terminal is nebulous and not helpful. Um, if a, any patient wants to refuse care, they have the right to refuse care. It doesn't matter if they have a terminal illness or not. If I, if I say I want a DNR order, I can have a DNR order at the hospital. Um, so the right to refuse care is the fundamental right of every patient as part of um, informed consent. So I would change state laws and change hospital policies to uh, reflect that. That way we're not getting into the question of, oh, do they have a terminal irreversible condition, which uh, if, if someone's refusing a certain type of intervention, they can do that um, at any time. Not for their children necessarily. We, that's a different discussion though. Um, the other thing is I think we need to come to accept two finitudes. One is the, I had a big word, I'm a professor, sorry. Um, the finitude of life, that is that we indeed do die, and then the finitude of medicine, that medicine is not the source of eternal life, nor does it have the power to ease all suffering, nor does it have the power to um, do away with all the bio, psycho, social, spiritual needs of the patient, okay? So uh, realizing a modest medicine is what I would want. Um, St. Basil the Great in 350-ish, um, um, I think wrote the best two, three lines of medical ethics ever. He said, talked about when ought one utilize the healing arts of medicine. He said, well, medicine is for bringing longer life and better life, and it should, it can be used unless the person is being consumed by the illness or the treatment thereof, or if medicine is merely an encumbrance to one's death. I mean, that those simple lines, I think, bring so much wisdom as how we ought to approach life and death. Um, currently, I think physicians are often abdicating their responsibility to share when that time has come. Um, not sharing expectations. Now, I don't want to be too hard on the physicians because increasingly it's difficult to know when that time's come. I had, I had a patient um, who, my first meeting with her, I told her she was eligible for hospice because she had diffuse metastatic adenosine carcinoma. I mean, really bad cancer, and she was, it was everywhere, and she was eligible for hospice. That was six years ago. She's on a targeted cancer treatment, and I told her first visit, um, hey, 10 years ago, I would have said, it's time for hospice. Now, I don't know, we'll see how you do with this treatment, but um, you're eligible anytime if you start having symptoms or it's not tolerable, the, the, these are harder. But she had a terminal illness for six, still has, she's still alive, um, six years. These definitions of terminal, irreversible, are no longer the 1980s de definitions, which they weren't accurate then, but I think that they ought to be changed among other uh, issues. Mr. Rivas, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, ter speaking of terminology, um, it's really an unfortunate thing in uh, our culture, and I mean the entire English-speaking world culture, that there is no word for a rational suicide. The word suicide is a word <coughs> that there's no alternative word to say. You know, I believe that suicide, in my mind, which is not a definition, it's just how I look at it, but. I think suicide ought to be reserved for people who um, are, are uh, destructively terminating their own lives when they needed help. And um, that's an awful thing. Final Exit Network refers those people to suicide hotlines. Um, but we don't have a word to express the idea of somebody affirmatively acting either under physician aid and dying or, or uh, uh, just in their home.
to terminate their suffering at the time of their choosing in a way that doesn't carry all of the awful baggage of the word suicide. It sounds like you're condemning somebody to say that they even uh, uh, died from physician-assisted suicide. Another thing I'd like to see change, you're asking about cultural things. Mm -hmm. rather cultural than, things. Rather than changes in laws is I think hospice and um, people in the right in the movement for the right to death with dignity lead, need to outgrow the idea that people who are choosing to terminate their suffering are committing some kind of offense against hospice, and hospice has got to do something to stop that, and hospice is hostile to the idea of people affirmatively choosing to die and that they're inconsistent with hospice. I don't think there's any inconsistency. I don't think there's any reasoning for that, and I think that hospice ought to just embrace or at least be neutral to the recognition that people can be in hospice. Uh, your patient that you've described, has she been in hospice for six years? Oh, no. No? Okay. No, no. Well, she could have been. And anybody can be in hospice for a long time, and they need those services, and, that, and that's a wonderful thing. The, uh, um, if they choose to have hospice and then choose to affirmatively terminate their suffering when the time comes, those things are not inconsistent, and the uh, uh, entire hospice movement ought to uh, come to recognize that. Sure. Two, two, I'm sorry. I, um, if I could, uh, two, I, I, I don't know if all hospices are good at long care. I, I mean, so all, just about all hospices are good in the last four weeks of life. Some hospices are good in the last months of life. And some hospices have been able to train their staff and keep staff long enough. So many hospices deal with so much staff turnover, it's hard to train fast enough. Uh, and I, uh, I gave testimony of this to CMS. I, I, Open-ended hospice, though it could be theoretically a good service, I don't know if it's necessarily so. They, um, hospices don't always do well with mixed goals of care, where you're going back to the hospital we're back to the ICU, we're back to something else. So I don't know about the long stay hospice. Um, I do agree with the, the language. English is very limited in its words for suicide. I do think something called rational suicide exists. I mean, Huntington's disease is kind of case in point. Um, and a Marine jumping on a grenade to save his comrades didn't commit suicide. He self-sacrificed himself. All of Christianity is based on the Theanthropos, the God-man, um, willingly going to crucifixion. The lives of the saints have many saints that leapt into the arms of God to, to, uh, to flee sin. Um, these aren't seen as suicide in the church. There's something different. Um, we, we have a term for kind of mercy killing, but we don't have one for um, kind of the rational mercy uh, suicide, which I'm still opposed to. And the reason I'm opposed, and I think hospices ought to try to, I mean, our response, I'm on the Ethics Committee for the American Academy Hospice Palliative Medicine, and we were very clear to make, if someone requests um, uh, aid in dying or assisted suicide, what's your response? And it's asking why which takes a lot for physicians and nurses and others. You have to sit down and you say, why? And sometimes those whys are things we can deal with. Um, it's not always uh, um, do the efficient task, which would be, okay, well, it's your choice and you can do it, which I don't think Robert or his group would say that that's true either. Uh, they don't want it be, I don't think they want to push suicide. They want people that have decided that that's the right track to be able to have that right. I, I don't want that for my patients. I think it's bad for them. I mean, but my main argument is for God's sake, don't. <laughs> I can't prove to you that suffering's all relieved. <laughs> um, that's the, one of those great mysteries that, uh, you know, uh, humankind has struggled with for millennia is what happens when we die. And uh, for those of us that say there, uh, there is life beyond, uh, suicide is a fearful thing. And that's the basis for my opposition. Okay, well, hold your thought there. Uh, we're going to move to audience questions here in a few minutes. So uh, please step up to the microphone over there if you have a question. And don't be shy. Uh, give your name and, and ask your question. Um, but one final thought, you were talking about what happens after you die, and I, I think there's something that I've noticed, and it, it happens a lot with couples who have been married a long time, and you'll see one of the, one person in the couple dies, and the other person who might be perfectly healthy, 
at the time of that death, they seem to go downhill rapidly. It's like their health just goes on a bullet train and they die shortly after. So is there really, oh, I, people call it dying of a broken heart. Does that really happen? I think it's evidence of a merciful God. If I've, I've been married most of my life, and if my wife died, I would be a pathetic um, a human. And, um, and uh, it also shows that we are integrated beings. This idea of a dualistic mind-body dualism um, uh, is not true. We, we do, indeed. Our, what, our thoughts, our emotions, our, um, our spiritual life affect our physiologic or biological life. And I, I think these are... this this occurrence is common, um, especially the husband that loses a wife. Um, the, the wives do better. 75% 75 so of wives will outlive their husband, right? So 75% of wives will outlive their husband. They do better, uh, partly because there's just more to do better, um, but uh, husbands don't do as well when they lo lose wives. Okay, well, I see we have a lot of people lined up over there, and I want to get everyone in. So uh, let me go ahead and, uh, like I said, step up to the mic, ask your questions. And for the courtesy of everyone, please don't uh, go along with long, long comments and long questions like I'm doing right now. Sorry. Okay? Uh, first one, please. I have a question for Mr. Revis about legal standing. So I have lost both my parents and been through this for, with both of them. Um, so I assume the patient's died that had these lawsuits about the end of care? What's their legal standing? I, I, does that, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not sure I'm asking that right. But once you're, it's like um, power of attorney that expires after the person dies because then the person isn't alive anymore. But how do they have legal standing to sue the hospital for poor end of care? Oh, you does mean that, in, the, in the case of, a, of, I suggested bringing a lawsuit after the person's dead? Yes. I, oh, and I okay. get the two lawsuits you talked about, those people, I, I, I assume that they had died. Yeah, I, I, now I got you. Okay. Um, and it's a good question. It's an interesting legal question. The, 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 there's a, an important distinction between a right to, to uh, a wrongful death lawsuit, which can be brought by, uh, say, the widow of a man who died by being hit by the Coca-Cola delivery truck. Um, then the, the widow has standing because she lost the solace and comfort and employment and so forth of her husband, and that's her damages. When a person is denied uh, the right to, their, to the enforcement of their advance directive, they don't have a wrongful death. They have a wrongful maintenance of their life beyond the point where they didn't want to have their life anymore. And the standing derives solely to the estate of the person. So the estate is a theoretical uh, thing out there, uh, incorporeal entity <laughs> that carries on um, until, it's, until it's closed. And this, the estate can recover the damages for, for the person who died uh, under those circumstances. OK. Next question, please. Marion Harris, uh, I'd like to hear you some more comments about the right to take your own life. I mean, it just whether you've got a long-standing illness, whether you just feel I've had a good life and it's time to end it, isn't that a personal decision and why should the law or a doctor or somebody else say, no, you can't? Um, well, that's... You're singing our song. That's, yeah, I know. <laughs> that's, you're preaching to the choir. I, that's, that's what we think, and think except in the case, I do think society ought to have the authority and the power to intervene in the case of people who uh, uh, are trying to, are planning to or trying to commit what I referred to as real suicide. But when a person has made an intelligent choice to die, whether they choose to jump off a bridge or or uh, read a book. Our organization is called Final Exit Network. The namesake is the book called Final Exit that was written by Derek Humphrey in the early 1990s, and it's a how-to manual for people to, uh, uh, <laughs> here we go again with that, that irony, how to safely die. Right. I mean, there's, there's nothing more bad for a person who wants to terminate their suffering than to botch it and live on with, you know, d disabilities caused by your attempt. And we just seek to help educate people. Uh, really, it's just a very fancy version of all we do is, is take the book to them and explain it in better terms and show them things. And, and if they want us to be at their bedside because nobody likes to die alone, then we'll do that too. 
um, it is often wrongly called assisted suicide, what Final Exit Network does. We don't assist, we don't physically touch anything. We won't hand the person a glass to take a pill. Um, our exit guides are trained by none other than me to make sure that they don't do that because then they'll be violating the law against assisted suicide. But um, as long as they don't do that, in this country historically, it was always the case that uh, uh, that there would be, uh, it's a First Amendment protected right to communicate, take somebody a book, explain to them about the book, that's all First Amendment protected for free speech. And uh, we have a precedent now in, in Minnesota, which is a, an extreme out, outlier, where in a case involving Final Exit Network, where there was no assistance whatsoever for the first time ever, a, a, a high American court ruled that you can commit the crime of assisting in a suicide solely with speech. They openly acknowledged that there was no physical assistance, but found that that could happen. And through a number of legal maneuvers, I was unsuccessful in getting it to the Supreme Court of the United States, but that's the law in Minnesota now. Okay, next question, please. Uh, my name is Mike Schettinger from Schettinger Funeral Home. So obviously I'm in uh, this business as well. Um, and our family's been doing this for 160 years. So we've heard everything over the years. And I believe the majority of people would love to be able to end their life when they're just going to be so much suffering. We hear that daily. Um, I wish we could have done this for mom or dad. My question is, uh, I understand in Canada, Last year, they just approved this nationwide. Am I right on that? It goes back a little further than it, that. It's more than a year. Yeah. And I'm just curious, you don't hear about it at all. And I know there's rules and a lot of stipulations to do it, to actually perform it. But um, is that a precedent that you think will make it to America? Is it working well there? Is it not working well? You just don't hear about it. So I'm just curious how it's going in Canada. Let me, let me take the legal part of that and ask Dr. Nash to talk about whether it's working well. Um, Canada is just a, a, a very different place. It, they find it annoying that they're so often abroad, you know, thought of as just being, you know, the other kind of Americans. But um, the Canadians are very different and they, the, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled, it's been what, about five years? It's been so, several years about five years in a case called Carter versus Canada that it is a fundamental, what, what to an American would be, would be referred to as a fundamental constitutional right to have your doctor terminate your suffering at the time of your choosing if you're a competent adult who's making a, a, a rationally justifiable choice because of, because of illness. Um, it's so stunning that it, that, it, the, that it just, it could never have happened in the United States. And the, they not only authorized a physician aid in dying, but in Canada there are doctors who specialize in going to the bedsides of patients, sometimes at home, sometimes in hospices, uh, and performing uh, euthanasia. Euthanasia, the distinction between euthanasia and assisted suicide is that like Dr. Kevorkian, when somebody died with his assistance, the person had to press a button. It was the final act that was necessary to induce the death. And if, and if the final act is performed by the patient, I'll call the person a patient, um, if the final act is prefer, performed by the patient, then, then, uh, then it's been an assisted suicide. And if the final act is performed by the doctor, then that's euthanasia. And the doctors in Canada actually inject people with uh, three, uh, drugs uh, that cause the person's death while the doctor is there actively doing it. I, I think that the American medical culture is many years away from going along with that. Well, I, th I think the Canadian culture, medical culture, is still many decades, uh, if ever, um, uh, interested in it as well. The Canadian medical, uh, the physicians in Canada are quite split. Um, so there is this distinction between physician assisted suicide or physician aid in dying, sometimes called, it's called that in Canada, and voluntary act of euthanasia. That is someone either uh, had first person authorization, so the patient asked to uh, in advance or at the time be euthanized. Um, both of those are legal. The, there is no state in the United States that legal, has legalized that. There are several states now that have legalized physician assisted suicide 
or physician aid in dying. Um, one of the biggest challenges in Canada is the uh, debate over conscientious refusal. Um, because uh, Canada has said there's a, a charter right, uh, the equivalent to the Constitution, but it's different from the Constitution. So the United States is based on forbearance rights, right? Our Constitution is based on the right to be left alone. The government will not intervene in. Um, that's actually the basis for final exits uh, uh, argument. Um, the Charter right, uh, the Canadian Charter is based on French human rights, that you have the right to certain entitlements because as being a citizen. The, the different, con different constitutional alignments. So um, the, uh, because of the Charter right and because Canada, Canada has a, a, a federal service, a health service, that's the main funding source, the Canadian government can say, doctor, you must. You must do it. So if you have a physician who doesn't want to participate in killing their patient, um, it's not clear that they can refuse. Um, and at first, Canada was going to say, yes, they can refuse, but then there were, they found out that there were whole regions of Canada that didn't have a physician willing to participate. This recapitulates a debate we had after Roe, uh, Roe v. Wade, um, an issue of conveyance um, in the United States. What was a reasonable distance for someone to travel to procure something that was considered to be a right? Okay, it's even more powerful in Canada. I don't think it will come to the U.S. in that regards. And of course, I'm against it. I've, I mean, like, a, I've, a lot of patients have asked for me to help hasten their death. Um, to my knowledge, none of them have. I've cared for over 5,000 patients. I don't see it as a needed step. I do think it's a fear that people have, but people have a lot of fears. I think it's my role to try to help them through those fears as best I can. Um, and like Robert rightly said, suicide is not illegal, so long as you're successful. Um, I, I don't think that that necessitates um, uh, making physicians part of, or medicine part of the act, nor do I think, um, I think Final Exit has shown that it's not needed to have physicians as part of the act. It is, uh, it's much like our medical marijuana, um, uh, medical marijuana is all about advertising for recreational marijuana. To get everybody to say, oh, this is medical, it's good, it's, it's, it's wholesome, it's acceptable, right? It's just a, it's an advertising ploy. Um, and for recreational marijuana, for it to come out and be a multi-billion dollar industry, which it already is. Um, physician aid in dying, I think, is trying to give the priests of our era, the big cathedral, the health system, and the priests of our era, the doctor, and their flowing white gowns, to come and bless something that gives us some moral dissonance. Okay, um, I know we've got a few people over there and we just have a few short minutes, so uh, I, I ask you to go ahead and continue and uh, ask some more questions. Next. Hi, uh, thanks for the discussion. My name is Michael Kirkman. I'm Executive Director of Disability Rights Ohio, and we represent uh, people with disabilities throughout the state. We work closely with other national groups like ADAPT, and uh, that are made up of people with disabilities and take positions on issues such as this, uh, Not Dead Yet, which is an extremist group that's opposed to physician suicide uh, of any kind and euthanasia in particular. Um, I'd like to try to hear, hear from you all for, through a disability paradigm how this works and the spinal cord injury is one example. Uh, terminal cancer may be different, but these are people with disabilities and it, where does, these, where do these choices end? Where do conflicts of surrogates fit into that? Because we see that in our cases quite a bit that you've already alluded to. But technically these are all people with disabilities and they needed to be accommodated and there needs to be effective communication and I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. And, and I'd like to hear them kind of briefly so we could hear the other people ask yeah, I'll, their I'll questions say, I'll well. say very briefly that I think uh, we should value the life of those with, who are disabled, but also we should value the choices of them or their surrogate. That um, foregoing uh, medical treatment ought to be their right as well, um, and their surrogate decision maker um, should be able to use that right to forego, forego, forego medical treatment as, uh, as well. I think that will take care of most of the problems with end of life um, uh, decisions in, uh, in folks with disability? I think um, uh, a disabled person's right to make a competent choice should be vindicated as much as it should for anybody else. I, I don't really understand what the issue is. When, when I, I litigated a constitutional case in Florida in the 1990s, I found that uh, uh, I had a lot of disability 
uh, disabled lawyers who file briefs saying to suggest that we're not supposed to be able to choose physician aid and dying because we're disabled would be the rankest form of discrimination against disabled people. Okay, this is going to kind of have to be a lightning round here because we want to get in as many questions as possible, so brevity is awesome. Uh, next question. Hi, I'm Lori Moffitt, and I'm the director of the Urban Zen Integrative Therapy Program at Sussman Hospice and Wexner Heritage Village, and I'll be super fast. How do you see Dr. Nash adjunct therapies like mindfulness meditation being addressing things like fear um, for the patients? Because I found that that really works well on some level in the work that I do. What, what kind of medication? Meditation. meditation. Mind, mindfulness oh, meditation. Oh, how, okay. to, how to gotcha. address that in fear. I'm a little hard yeah. hearing. Um, so um, I, I'm not a big meditation fan. I mean, I, that, there, it is peculiar in our modern society that particular Hindu practices are accepted, but others, uh, other religious practices are suspect. I think that's a problem. Um, there, it's partly because it became acceptable in the field to gather data on them. I do think co contemplative practices as a whole um, from a, a wide, uh, different uh, traditions may be a benefit. Um, I wouldn't prescribe mindfulness meditation or yoga, but um, I don't stop people from doing that. But I may, there are particular things in my tradition that may do similar. I, th I think they do well. Uh, there are some other um, alternative practices that I think may be troubling. Um, uh, the use of virtual reality, I think, is a kind of escapism, um, uh, unless it's used for entertainment, but there are some people advocating it for actually escapism. I think think that um, isn't the way to prepare um, to die. Okay, next question quickly. Okay, well, it's, it's probably appropriate that we're the ones kind of wrapping it up. Um, myself and, and Diana here, we are volunteer advocates with Ohio End of Life Options, and I just wanted to make people aware of what's happening here in Ohio, just that we are um, a nonprofit advocacy group that is working towards having a medical aid and dying law in Ohio. Um, so a lot of the questions seem to be very, um, you know, centered around that, and I just wanted to make people aware that there was something out there like that. And if anybody has any questions, you're you know welcome to, to talk to us afterwards. But I just wanted to thank um, the Metropolitan Club for having this conversation. I think if we've learned nothing from this is that it's a very complex and very personal issue end of life is. And one of the biggest things, and I think the takeaway today is go home, talk to your family, let people know what your wishes are, and have that communication as an ongoing process because it really does make it better when it's an ongoing conversation. We're kind of out of time. I'm going to turn this back over to Carol. Thank you all. Although today's topic was a difficult one, I hope you were enlightened and found it useful for our own planning. Meanwhile, let us thank our speakers, Ryan Nash, Robert Rivas, and Joe Engels for today's forum. Hope to see you all next Wednesday.